welcome to episode 133 of the Daniel Yours Podcast. Fitness stuff that works better than it should. Let's go. Welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Solo episode coming at you. It's been a while since I've done a solo episode. Luckily, I've had a really, really great stream of guests and have a continued great stream of guests in the foreseeable future. Uh, for the first time ever, I really actually got like ahead of booking podcast guests instead of scrambling and I have kind of I actually got too far ahead at one point and you know I'm in a, I'm in a sweet spot now with with the uh, the cadence of the show and not getting too far ahead so that I'm recording episodes that are coming out in a close time frame uh, to when they're actually recorded but uh, but I'm not scrambling for, for for guests week to week so here we are with a with a solo episode now what I'm going to do with this episode and I'm going to try and make this kind of housekeeping beginning stuff short as I always like to just little you know little podcast slash life updates in these solo episodes because I've had the steady stream haven't had the need or the 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 space in the podcast to kind of do some more targeted ones so this is going to be a little bit of a mishmash I have some kind of Q&A stuff uh or some some questions to answer uh, from you guys from, from Instagram and from the last one and whatnot um and then there's a, a kind of a section that uh, an episode that I've been wanting to be doing about fitness stuff that works better than it should. And this is not really stuff that like can't be proved. Like there's a reason why it works, but it's like, it's disproportionate. And so I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, there was something else that I wanted to mention off the bat. No, I think that's it. I'm going to try and keep this episode, um, fast paced. Uh, so I'm not going to go super deep into, into anything, but if you have questions on things, I'm always available on Instagram. Send me a DM at Daniel Yours. If you don't follow me already or, or go to my website, DanielYours.com, you can email me there, whatever questions you have. If you're looking for coaching, uh, that's obviously available as well. Uh, one-on-one online coaching, fitness, nutrition, health, lifestyle, all of the things. Uh, and that's not a great sales pitch, but um, what I'm actually working on is something that's going to be offered. And this is just based on like age and stuff. Oh, this is what I was going to say. The, the day this, this episode uh comes out will be my birthday. So this is not like a turning 29. This will not be a 29 lessons and turning 29. I'll save that for next year, turning 30, which is terrifying to say It feels, makes me feel very old. And I know that that's very young to, to some of you listening. Um, but, uh, the thing that I was going to say in regards to coaching is like a lot of people in and around my age group, friend group circles, friends of friends and whatnot, everyone's getting married soon. We're in that age, married and kids and stuff. And so I really want to work with people who are getting married in the next year and help you to look your best on that day. And that may seem shallow and like, hey, I've never been that guy about lose such and such weight and whatever. And that's true. The difference here is that getting married is a great motivator. And if that's the thing that gets the ball rolling to get you to get involved in your health and fitness and you have this time stamp of, of the date that you're getting married and you want to look your best on that day because you're going to have your photos for forever and you're going to feel your best and working out and getting in shape is a lot more effective and cheaper than photoshopping things on the day, which is unbelievably expensive, you know, starting to go through that process uh, for that stuff. Um getting in shape now is going to be a great motivator to then work into the rest of your life, right? If you can use this time getting married now as the time to kickstart things, you know, post university, post high school, you've let yourself go a little bit, whatever the case is. And I use this date of your marriage to kind of get things going. You can kick this into for the long term. So that's kind of what some of my, you know, marketing, if you want to say is going to be surrounding um, because I think it's a really great opportunity for for you to start kickstarting this journey and and together with your with your spouse um, so look for that in the, in the coming uh, weeks and months and uh, it takes time it's not like this is not a crash course thing right I'm not asking for people who are getting married next week but sometime next year which is six nine 12 months away um, so keep an eye out for that online coaching and, and in person if you happen to Live close to me, but you already know that if you do. Anyways, uh, I said I'll try and keep this rapid fire, and uh, I will. So, uh, so here we go. We'll start with the Q and A, and then I'll get into kind of the the stuff that works um, type stuff. First question, and and some of these could be like massive ones, but I'm going to try and keep them just kind of you know more surface level, more actionable stuff. Should you do cardio or weights first? There is no right answer to this. The answer is it totally depends on what your main goal is. For most of you in the gym, your main goal is going to be building strength, building muscle, um, and improving your mobility and the way you feel. You're going to need more energy to do that 
for lifting weights rather than the cardio that you're doing. Now, if your goal specifically is to be improving your cardiovascular fitness, and I need to be very clear about this, improving your cardiovascular fitness, not losing fat, then if your goal is to improve your cardio, then you do your cardio first and then you do your weight second. Very few people that I know, unless you're training for a marathon or something like that, are like specifically trying to improve their cardiovascular fitness. It's something that should be involved in part of the whole thing, but it's not really your main goal. Even if you're trying to lose weight, do your weights first, hit your strength workout first, and then jump on the treadmill or the bike or whatever afterwards. You want to have the most energy saved up for the thing that you're going to focus the hardest on and apply the most intensity to, and that is your weightlifting. Especially if you're using a like not going for a run, which is like you're on the bike or even elliptical or rower, you're fixed in that machine. The chances that you injure yourself doing something because you're tired is astronomically low. Going for a run might be different if you just did a heavy leg day and then you're going for a run. Like I wouldn't suggest that, but if you did an upper body day and went for a run, that would be fine. But um, doing your cardio first and then going into weights, which is a little bit more technical, you hopefully are lifting with some intensity and that's where, you know, things might slip. You get, you get mentally fatigued, physically fatigued, and that's where, you know, some injuries can happen. And not to mention, you're just leaving gains on the table if you're just not training intensely. So cardio or weights first for most people hit your weights first. There's no real answer to this, but it's just logically or logistically rather, uh, more efficient to hit your weights first and then do your cardio second. Another question was just around time-saving workouts, and there wasn't actually a question. It was just like, what, can you give me some time-saving workouts? Obviously, this depends on your context and why you're looking for time-saving workouts. If it's just like, you know, you travel um, and you need like some quick hotel workouts between meetings or stuff like that, then then that's fine. Um, and the best way to do that is just to do things in a circuit fashion. So like the the travel workout, which is a very quick workout that I give to like all my uh, all my clients is really just like a squat and, and if they have a band that's always better but it's like a squat you know push up um a, a glute bridge of some sort and maybe some band bent over rows or something like that and and maybe a a plank or something so it's like a squat a push a pull a hinge and an abs and you just do that 10 reps each and just do as many rounds of that as you can so you go one to five exercises in order that's one round rest for a minute and then just do as many rounds as you have time for. So then that way the workout can take anywhere from five minutes to, you know, 45 minutes, however, however long you want. This isn't a great workout for like working towards something. And if you are really trying to shave off time of your workout, it's not really a workout that's going to add muscle or whatever. You can't, can't just cheat the, the, the process. Like you can't hack the process and just do things in less time with less effort uh, and less intensity and get the same results. If that were the case, we would obviously just all do that. But these workouts are great for just, you know, keeping the ball rolling, making you feel good, all the general benefits of exercise, getting you sweaty, getting your heart rate up, all that stuff. Now within the gym, a way to save time that, that doesn't really take away from the effectiveness is a couple things. You can use supersets and for some reason it's, it's a foreign to a lot of people, this concept of using supersets. One, I understand that it's difficult in a busy gym where you're doing supersets with different pieces of equipment. But the way to do supersets effectively and correctly is do supersets with either two exercises that use the same piece of equipment or one exercise that, you know, the first one that uses a squat bar, whatever, a barbell. And then the second exercise uses nothing. So you might pair um, like just a bodyweight exercise on the floor. So look for exercises that use back to back the same piece of equipment or one with a piece of equipment and one with not so that you can just do it on the floor right beside the machine or right beside the rack or beside the bench or whatever it is. Um, and, and that's a really good way to to save time in your workouts. Now, you still got to train hard. You still got to rest the, the appropriate amount of time and try and choose exercises that are not um, combating with each other. But that that's really kind of a simple way to go about saving time in your workouts. This was an interesting question. Um, and it's, it can again, get super detailed, but the question was phrased around if I had 5,000 calories of pasta only a day and, you know, my clone had 5,000 calories of steak per day and we had the same output, same daily activity, same workout, same everything, what would happen? Now it's an interesting thought experiment because 
it's interesting because it's completely unrealistic. Like, obviously, this is this is not going to happen, and you can make the calorie count whatever you want. Assuming that you were at maintenance, then your weight would stay the same. Now, 5,000 calories worth of pasta would possibly have, like, a sufficient amount of protein to keep muscle, but like a, a more realistic, like that's a lot of pasta, but but a more realistic calorie count, let's, let's say 2000, uh, probably wouldn't. And eventually you'd probably start to lose some muscle. Um, and, and the reason why, let me back that up. You'd probably start to lose some muscle, which would then change you and your clone would start to change. And then your maintenance levels would be different. The person eating the 5,000 calories of steak would probably maintain their body much better simply because they're having sufficient protein and fats. The person having the pasta is having insufficient protein and fats, and therefore they'd start to lose muscle and have some other issues. So in a very short term, they would be the same because they're having the same amount of calories, so their weight would stay the same. As time goes on, these person's body composition, these two people's body composition would start to change, and that would change their base metabolic rate, how many calories their body requires just to survive. And that's when things would start to would start to flip. Now, it would take some time for this to happen. Again, this is a completely unrealistic thing because no one's doing this. Um, I think the basis of this question was more getting at, well, should I just eat steak or should I just eat carbs and does it, the food quality matter? The answer is both. You your food quality absolutely does matter, but it doesn't trump the amount of calories that you're eating when we're talking about weight loss specifically. Calories are king for weight loss. Now, how you go about making that deficit and and divvying up your calories and stuff is a whole other conversation. Um, So you want to eat high quality foods, but eating way too much high quality foods is still going to cause you to gain weight or to not lose weight. So There's got to be a healthy balance there. You're going to eat high quality foods and in a correct amount. And that's the sweet spot. That's where you want to end up. So a lot more nuance to that question, but I hope that that like the gist of the answer is that your food quality matters, but your food quantity also matters. You can't say that one is necessarily more important in a blanket statement than the other. They're both important and, and they both maybe have more importance in different scenarios, uh, but both are important, and and that's what you got to take away with, from that because obviously that that thought experiment is unrealistic. No one no one would ever do that. Um, another question was around how to go about calculating calories burned. So here's a news flash for some of you. I'm pretty sure I've said this at some point on the podcast before, or I've talked about it with somebody. Um, the calories burned metric on your smartwatch or or, or bracelet or whatever tracking thing you use is not reliable and completely useless. These these devices have been shown to be like up to 90% inaccurate. And if that is the case, then that makes it completely useless. So how do you go about actually calculating calories burned? My answer is you, you don't because it doesn't matter. There are ways to do this that are quite complex, and if you want to do it with any real degree, meaningful degree of accuracy, you would need some specialized equipment that you just don't have access to, and you wouldn't have access to. But the amount of calories you're burning doesn't actually matter. What you want to track, the context of this question is obviously about weight loss, and I want to make sure that I'm burning enough, quote-unquote, calories to be in a deficit so that I'm losing weight. The way to think of it is this. Don't worry about the number of calories you're burning. Track your weight every day. Are you losing weight? Yes or no? If the answer is no, increase your activity. If that means you were walking 20 minutes a day, increase your activity to 30 minutes a day. Are you losing weight? Still no? Okay, increase activity again, 40 minutes a day. Are you losing weight? Yes. Okay, great. Now you're burning a sufficient amount of calories to lose weight. It's really that simple. The number of calories that you're actually burning versus the the amount of weight that you're actually losing is just you're creating extra work for yourself and something that doesn't really matter. Just track what's happening and then adjust your actions accordingly. That is, that is either increasing your activity, lowering your food intake, ideally some combination of both until you're at a point where you're losing weight at a steady pace that is uh, sustainable for the time being and comfortable for you to be losing weight. So that's how to think about it. Don't actually worry about calculating these things. They don't matter. Is the desired result happening? If yes, great. If not, change your actions. 
Another question, another kind of simple one. Uh, how do you, often do you need to train your arms? But again, no right answer. And you'll, I feel bad sometimes doing, doing these Q and A type things because like, I know that very often the answer is like, eh, it doesn't really matter. Or like, it depends on like such and such factors. And the, the truth is that that's true. Like there's not really a hard and fast answer. How often do you need to train your arms? You don't ever need to train your arms. If you want to have giant arms, you should train them more often. If you don't want to have giant, giant arms, then you don't need to train them that often. Now, I don't think that anyone training less than three times a week needs to do really any direct arm work. Now, you can do it for fun. It's it's certainly not bad. It's just not the best bang for your buck with the limited training time that you're, you're using. If you're going over three times a week, you definitely have some training time, some training space to add in some direct arm work if that's if that's what you choose. Same, same as like calves and stuff like, you know, forearms. Like how many sets of forearms do you do a week? Like zero <laughs> because it just gets worked and other stuff. If I was training 10 times a week, yeah, maybe I'd do some forearm curls and stuff like that. Like it's just not necessary unless you have extremely specific goals or you're training for an extremely long amount of time. So you don't really need to train them that often. They will benefit because they're a small muscle group recover quickly. They'll benefit from more frequent uh, training if that's like something you really want to specialize in. But your arms your and arms being your biceps and triceps get plenty of stimulus if you're training your back and chest and shoulders correctly. So if you're doing that and you don't want to have particularly large arms, you don't really need to train your arms that often and maybe not at all. And if you do want bigger arms, you still don't need like not even giant arms, just like a little bit bigger. You still don't need that many sets. You can do like maybe two sets of biceps, two sets of triceps in a week. And that would be enough to just get them going a little bit more. As long as you're training correctly, actually hitting the muscle that you want to be hitting, training with intensity and, and training kind of close to failure, then you'll start to see some notable um, increase in, in your arms and your biceps and triceps. But aside from that, doesn't really have to be that much a priority. They're not that big of a muscle group. So like a small amount of increase in them will make it look a lot bigger. For example, you know, if you added one pound of muscle to your biceps, your bicep would look significantly bigger. If you added one pound of muscle to your quads, like no, you wouldn't notice because it's obviously just spread over a way larger area. So they don't require that much more effort. Um, they don't require a ton of growth to have like the noticeable growth that, that you're looking for. Next question was around um, what type of energy drinks or intra-workout hydration drinks people should be drinking. <sighs> like probably none, you, unless you're a pro athlete or it's like a very particularly hot day and you sweat like an absolute ton. You don't need a, a hydration drink. You certainly, I think the reason this question came up was because of that prime drink. First of all, that drink is a terrible hydration drink. You're better off just drinking just drinking regular water. Like it's not it's not good. <laughs> and there are plenty of better, more in depth videos on YouTube that you'll find about that. And so you know, go out and search that on your own. But there's literally zero reason ever for you to drink Prime unless you're just a Logan Paul fanboy, which is a questionable decision at best. So don't drink Prime. Um, but even other drinks like unless you're cr like doing crazy long workouts and it's really hot and you're sweating an absolute ton. You just don't need it. Make sure you're drinking regular water. If you like the taste of it and you want to, like, fine. It doesn't, it's not going to negatively impact you. It's just doing nothing positive for you. So if you want to save your money, be a little bit more economical, then just don't do it. Make sure you're regularly hydrated drinking water. And, um, and that's it. That's all. Now, the last question we had here, I'm doing a pretty good job of, of keeping these uh, answers relatively short. Last question we had here was about tips around meal prepping. Now, first of all, that this is a very general question, so it's hard to give a very specific answer to a very general question that's a kind of a large topic. But meal prepping is not that hard. And, oh, well, you know, you're a fitness guy. Of course, meal prepping is not that hard to you. But I, yeah, I, I hear it. Well, there's two ways we can go about this. I can tell you that it's hard and tell you how difficult it is, or I can tell you that it's not that hard and hopefully you might actually do it. Because the truth is, it just takes a little bit of organization. 
I wrote this on my Instagram today. When I was uh, like a kid growing growing up, I'm the I'm the oldest of three boys. We all played sports at, at competitive levels. We're out every single night of the week in different locations, sometimes across the across the city. And my youngest brother is like quite a bit younger than me, so at the height of it, like he was a a baby, you couldn't take care of himself, and so had to be dragged along everywhere. Um, while while we were we were playing different sports in different parts of the city, both my parents worked full time. My mom does all the food, all the, all the stuff, like all the cooking, grocery shopping, the dinners, everything. Um, we never once ate at like a restaurant or a drive through on like regular nights. Of, of course we did you no know, on special occasions and whatnot, but on like a regular Wednesday on the way to soccer practice, we never just stopped at McDonald's and went to the drive through because like we didn't have time to have or make dinner and, and she was working full time. Now one, my, my mom is amazing. So there's that, but, <laughs> but two, it's not because she has some like some secret as to how this was possible. It was just about preparation. She knew what the schedule was for the week. So on the weekend or the week before, whatever it was, she would look at it, say, okay, you know, we've got these things on these days. So we have to be in these places at these times. That means we have to, you know, we've got to eat dinner every day. So that's one thing. What can I make on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whatever. What do I need to buy from the grocery store? Okay, make sure I have those things. What can I pre-prep? My mom wasn't really into build into doing like multiple day leftovers. Like we didn't have an entire meal prep for the whole, you know, for for all of us in the house and all of our food and Tupperwares. But like there was stuff that was kind of pre-prepped. Either it was washed and cut, or it was you know cleaned and seasoned or whatever, and just needed to be cooked or thrown in the oven or whatever. Now, not every single night was my mom was a phenomenal cook, but not every single night was like you know gourmet you know five course dinners. Sometimes they were very simple, and that's great and okay, obviously. Um, and you have to come to terms with that, but things were pre-prepped and pre-thought about. And so that the cooking process, the cleanup process, whatever was as simplified and as thought about as possible, because if not, then you end up like, Oh, it's six o'clock. We have, uh, you know, no food in the house there's nothing prepared, nothing clean. I guess we, we, we have to order out or go to the drive through whatever. And, and keep in mind, like, not that I'm that old again, but this was before grocery delivery was a thing. And before, you know, Uber eats and, and food delivery to the house was really popular aside from, you know, like pizza, ordering pizza was the only thing. Um, so, so those weren't even options. And, and I say that story one to just, I you know, highlight how amazing my mom is, but two, because my mom's not a fitness person. My mom never talked to anyone about meal prep. She didn't have a nutrition coach. She just figured it out. And she thought, well, I need to feed my family. How do I feed my family without going to the drive through every day? We don't have that much time. We're busy. We're in different places. So that means I got to think a little bit about this beforehand. And yes, I'm saying this a little bit sarcastically. Yes, I'm saying this a little bit with an attitude. And it's because I think that a lot of people make things seem more difficult than they are. If you want to figure this out, you will figure it out. It is absolutely not rocket science. Now, for my clients who struggle with this, I give them of course, more directed and, and more specific uh, tips and, and information and, and support on that that is relevant to the context of their specific life. But I'm on the podcast, I'm not talking, you know, maybe I hope that it sounds like I'm speaking directly to you, but like this is a one-way conversation and you're not speaking back to me here. So so I can't give you direct advice. I don't know exactly what thing is going to help you with your life in this exact moment. But I know that you can figure it out. I know that you're capable of figuring it out because it's really not that complicated. How many meals do you need to have in the week? Let's say that's, or even if it's not even for the whole week, it's just for the next couple days. Okay. Nine meals over three days. Let's say I did nine meals over three days. Cause I couldn't do the math for, for, <laughs> for all the meals. Let's say it's 21 meals all the days. You know, you have that many meals. Okay. What are you going to eat for all those meals? Well, you're not gonna eat the same thing for every single meal. There's nothing terribly wrong with that, but you're probably not going to do that. So you want to have three or four options. Great. Three or four protein options, three or four vegetable options, three or four carb options. Buy those things and then look at your schedule in the week and say, when can I cook? Well, I can cook uh, some on Sunday, but I can't cook everything at once because I need the oven for this and that and I need the stove for that and I don't have that much space and I don't have six hours to cook on Sunday. I have two hours to cook on Sunday. So what can I get done in that day? 
do that. Then on Tuesday night, I could do the next thing. But on Sunday, while the chicken's in the oven, I can cut up the vegetables and do that so that on Wednesday when I, when I and, and, you know, seal them, put them in the fridge so that on Tuesday or Wednesday night when I can cook them again, then they're already cut and washed. I just got to, I just got to throw them in the pan and cook them, throw them in the oven, whatever. It just takes some thought. So again, I'm not trying to be condescending. I'm not trying to say, you know, my life was so hard and my mom figured it out. No, my, my life was great, but you know, we, we didn't, we didn't struggle for stuff, but the one equalizer among these things was, is, is time. Like the time, time is time. So my mom worked full time, whether you make a ton of money or not a little bit of money, time is time. You work those nine hours, you finish work at five, you got to be on the soccer field at seven o'clock. That's the same, no matter where you live in the world, no matter how much money you have, no matter all those things, it's figure outable. This is my point. It is figure outable and it just takes a little bit of effort. So get involved in your life, get involved in your own health and fitness. If you want to make these changes, I promise you, I promise you, you can do it. You just have to do it. That's the main thing. here. So hopefully that message gets through here. Now, there was a question about uh, the last one that I have here. We're doing pretty good on time. Um, was about intermittent fasting and what I think about it. And it's probably a question I've answered before, certainly in, in, in other formats. I don't know if I've talked about it on the podcast specifically, but this also kind of segues me into the stuff that works better than it should um, type of category. So I'm, so I'm going to do that. Now, intermittent fasting is an interesting thing. I think it is an excellent tool, but also wildly overrated. It's not, you know, this uh, magic bullet to say, oh, if you intermittent fast, you're going to get shredded all of a sudden. No, obviously not. If it was, and, and here's one way to qualify any claims that say like, just do this thing and you'll get whatever. The way to qualify it is using logic. If it was that simple, why doesn't everyone just do this? And the answer to that question is because it's not that fucking simple. (laughs) And that's why everyone doesn't do this. And that's why it's not magic. So this same thing applies to intermittent fasting. Great tool, not magic. The reason I think it's a great tool, it teaches you to not be a quote unquote slave to food where you can kind of control your hunger signals a little bit. Now, this doesn't mean that you need to starve yourself. You absolutely shouldn't be doing that. But you don't need to give in to every single hunger cue, every single hunger pang. You're sitting at your office. You, you just had lunch. It's 1.30. And all of a sudden, you get a little hunger. It's like, oh, got to get a snack. Nah, you, you probably don't need a snack. You probably don't. At night, you've had dinner, you, you felt good after dinner, you had a nice dinner, you cleaned up, you went for a walk, you're sitting on the couch, it's 8.30, scrolling your phone, watching TV, whatever, you get a little, oh, hunger, you're probably not hungry, you're probably not hungry. And so what intermittent fasting has done for, for, for myself and for a lot of people is that it teaches you to control this. If you can shorten a window where you're eating, you get to learn that like, oh, I can, I can acknowledge this feeling of hunger. And I can just silence it for a bit. I'm not going to, I'm not actually starving. I'm not going to die. I'm not actually starving to say like, oh, I must eat right now. Otherwise I'm going to, you know, whatever. Not going to happen. So it teaches you to kind of control that hunger a little bit. Now, the people who promote intermittent fasting as like their thing go way too far with it. It is absolutely not magical. I personally don't love it as like a long-term strategy. It seems to be actually... Uh, worse for women as well. And the funniest thing to me about the intermittent fasting crowd is that the best way, the most ideal way to actually do intermittent fasting for all of the actual, you know, the, the potential benefits of fasting is that you should be eating early in the morning, first thing when you wake up and then stop your eating window, you know, six to eight hours after, after that first meal, which will end up being, you know, like mid to late afternoon and then you kind of skip you know the traditional dinner time and that's that but and that because it's works in circadian rhythm with the sun it works with your your cortisol rise and, and fall through the day and, and all these you know hormonal changes throughout the day that's how you should be doing it if you're going to do it but everyone who's like a big proponent of intermittent fasting they skip breakfast push their first meal to a lunch they feel somehow superior for skipping breakfast because you know fuck the man fuck the system they said to eat breakfast is the most important meal of the day but look how lean i am not eating breakfast like as if that's some fucking trophy and then they push it to, to later in the day so that they can have 
dinner with their family and dinner with their friends or whatever. And for social reasons, that's that's fine. But you're you're negating a lot of the benefits, supposedly, of the fasting. You're just making yourself eat in a shorter window of time, which can have some benefits. But it's just like if you're gonna do the thing, then then do it right and do do the thing all the way. So so in a sense, intermittent fasting is a really good tool. It's a really good tool to use for, for a small period of time, I think, to kind of gain control of your hunger, especially if you're a person who uh, falls victim, so to speak, uh, to snacking, whether that's like mid-afternoon snacking or or post-dinner snacking, light nighttime snacking. I think it's a good tool to use, um, and it works better than it should for that reason. But like as a like an actual fat loss strategy for some people, they just they love the lifestyle and they like it, and you know what? By all means, like do your thing. It's not it's not horrible. Um, but it's also not not magic. So do it, but understand what it is uh, that you're doing. Another thing, or the next thing on on this list here of like stuff that works better than it better than it should. For me, I don't know that this is necessarily true across the board, but this is certainly something that's true for me. Is that I can never get as lean as I can if I'm not including some form of running outside running, not even treadmill running, but outside running in my training program. Now I know that that is not how fat loss works. Trust me. I know I don't need anyone to lecture me on that. I get it. But for some reason, it's just a thing that works for me. Now I've, I've actually spent a fair bit of time thinking about this because it's not like, and I've tried to, you know, loosely compare like the amount of activity to like, well, what if I don't run, but I, but I bike instead for the same amount of time or I, you know, use the rower or just like my general activity is the same with the biking and, and or sorry, with running versus all the other forms of activity that I'm doing, cardio and lifting and all things in between. And, and it somehow is, is just true that, I I get leaner when I'm including running versus not including running. And I honestly, I don't know the answer to this. I think that it's something to do with, I, I must unconsciously change the rest of my behavior when I'm including running, whether that means I'm getting more steps in the day outside of like dedicated walks or I'm somehow slightly changing my diet to include less food. Like I, I but it's not something that I'm doing consciously. Um, so I don't know. Now, the, the, the takeaway message for this for you is like, if you know that there's something like that that works for you, don't listen to the people who say that you shouldn't do that. Imagine, like there's nothing wrong with running. If, if it's, it's not destructive to me in any way. So for someone to come to me and say like, oh, you know what, actually, dude, that's not how uh, fat loss works and like you don't need to run and it's actually detrimental to blah 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 and you should just do like this instead like why why would i listen to that person running is not bad for me it's not causing me or anyone else any harm and if it feels good to me and it seems to work for me for a reason unknown or known might as well just include it so if there's a thing like that for you that like you know eating with your left hand instead of your right hand makes you lose weight or some, you know, whatever I can get, it can get quite ridiculous, but as long as it causes no harm and it's something that feels good to you and seems to work for you and makes you feel good, then just do it. Just do it. The per- perhaps the most like, uh, hot topic, one of this, and I've definitely, I've talked about this a lot and I won't spend much time on it. Um, things that work better than they should. And this is a perfect example of it is ice baths. Ice baths shouldn't work. It shouldn't really be helpful. The, the The biggest benefit really is that it just makes you feel good. A lot of it is just placebo, and that's okay. And, and in fact, there there's a solid chance that like it's actually doing some minor negatives to us. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that does negatives to us. So you know we optimize where we can. But like it feels good. Is it solving the problems of the world? No. Is it making my white fat turn into brown fat? And but I don't know. Is it reducing all the inflammation from my body and increasing this hormone and that thing. But I don't know. When I get out of the ice bath, I feel good. That's it. That's all. And that's all you got to know. If you believe it, it works. Now, there might be some detriment to this, so probably don't overdo it. But as long, again, same with the, you know, the running example. If it doesn't hurt you, it doesn't hurt anyone else, and it feels good to you and it makes you feel good, like you're making progress and doing the right things, by all means. Continue to do so. Next one, stuff that works better than it should. Not having carbohydrates at breakfast. Now, this is, again, 
not a hard and fast rule. There's nothing inherently evil with having carbohydrates for breakfast. It's just something that I've noticed for myself, for many of my clients, but not all of my clients, but many of them, where removing carbs at breakfast helps a lot with sticking to your diet and eventual fat loss. The reason for this, I believe, is because it forces you to have a higher protein breakfast. Because when you stop having carbohydrates, you're like, whoa, what do I even eat? I can't have toast for breakfast. I can't have cereal. I can't have this. I can't have that. So what do you do? What do you substitute with? You substitute with more eggs, yogurt, protein powders, things like this, which are going to have a higher protein in breakfast. Now, your lunches and dinners don't end up changing that much, but you've increased your protein at breakfast by maybe 20 to 30 grams of protein. So your overall intake for protein is 20 to 30 grams higher. And that's what I think is going to end up having those like positive effects. And you generally eat like quote unquote healthier food that's going to help keep your energy good during the day, make you feel better when you get to your workout, not give you that, you know, afternoon slump and all that stuff. So again, I don't need anyone attacking me. This is not a hard and fast rule. Sometimes I have carbohydrates for breakfast. I think fruits are kind of a, especially berries are kind of like the sweet spot exception um, to to the no carbs for breakfast uh, type of rule. But it's an interesting thing that I found to be extremely helpful that makes me feel good for the most part um, and has worked for a lot of my clients. So worth a shot seems to work better than it should on paper. And I think the common theme here with a lot of these works better than it should is that if we actually look at what's happening in a vacuum or you know on paper of these things is like there's not really a big effect there in the case of the ice baths there might be even a slight negative effect but it's like what what are the trickle down effects of the thing and so uh, you know a, a perfect example of this is also and it's not something that I actually wrote down I just thought of it now as I'm kind of rambling and this doesn't apply to me because I don't care about this stuff, but I know it applies to, to other people, is like buying new workout clothes. Buying new workout clothes has no impact on your metabolism, your strength, your your you know, your fat loss, your sleep. Like it has no impact on anything. But for some of you, what buying new workout clothes does is make you excited to go to the gym, get you excited to fit into new clothes, get you excited to lace up those new shoes, put on the cute outfit, put on the whatever, and get to the gym. And because you feel good, you train harder. And because you train harder, or maybe, maybe even let's, let's step this back, because you feel like going to the gym, you don't skip the gym. You feel good. You don't skip the gym. You get to the gym. Someone compliments it. Someone notices you. You you feel like you want to show it off. So you walk into the gym with your head held high, chest proud, and you're feeling great. You get through your warm up. You're like a, you you catch yourself and you know the side eye in the mirror. You're looking great. Wow, damn, look at me. I look good. I'm feeling good. Let's rip this workout. You train harder because you feel great, and because you did all that, you trained harder, and then you have better results. Now, did your workout close? impact your muscle protein synthesis? <laughs> Obviously not. But it had this trickle down effect of things that led to you doing more or better of the things that you should be doing or things you're already doing. And that's kind of what this whole section is about. I should have started with this. That's actually a great analogy. Wow. Wish I wrote more stuff down for this instead of just talked. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm going. And so keep keep that in mind now for 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 the remainder of this year. Um with workouts, and, and I guess it's kind of close to the the, uh, the, the clothes stuff, is uh, having the same warm the same warm up, the same kind of like pre workout routine, and using the same music. A lot of people, you know, they they tailor their workout playlist to the mood that they're in that day, whatever they're feeling. And listen, there's nothing wrong with it. Again, I I, I continue to feel the need to say this, but I shouldn't need to say this every single time. Nothing wrong with changing your music every day, listening to whatever you feel like. But a lot of people waste time just like fiddling with their music. You spend too much time thinking about it. It's, it's, it's a thought that's consuming you during your workout rather than you just have your playlist and that's your workout playlist. You don't really listen to those songs so much outside of your workout so that you know, and this is how I do it, my workout playlist is the same. It's been the same for a long time and it will probably be the same for a very long time. When those songs come on, it's go time. And I'm not, you know, I'm not gladiator, but like, you know, it's time to train. It gets me in the mood, gets me in the zone. I know that that song is, is, you know, these set of songs is like training music. And so it puts me in that mindset to train harder because I'm ready for it. Now, I don't have to think about, oh, skip that song. I don't like that song. Oh, skip this one. I don't know this one because I know all the songs. I curated them. They're there for a reason. I'm also not 
like confused or thinking about it like oh this is a new one let me let me just like rest a little bit longer while i listen to the end of this song because i haven't heard this one before no i know all the songs i know all the words every single song and and and, you know it's just part of kind of my my routine and this can translate even into the warm-up now the warm-up obviously this gets more specific with what you're doing but i think that there's a there's like a general warm-up not i think there's a general warm-up and then there's a specific warm-up your general warm-up should be pretty much the same. And this is how I do this for myself and for all of my clients. The general warm up is, is exactly the same from like day one to day uh, a million. It's the same because you're just getting the body feeling a little warm, feeling a little bit loose, feeling a little bit good, feeling ready to go. And that's your time to kind of get in your zone. And when you do those movements, you go through that warm up series, you know that it's go time. And then you can get into your specific warm up, which is more prevalent to like whatever workout it is that you're doing that day. And then you get, and then you get into your training session. This doesn't take very long. It takes like five minutes, maybe seven minutes if you're going slow. Um, and again, it's just routine. You're, you're developing routine. You're developing this system to know that it's go time when it's go time. Another thing that works better than it should is having skin in the game and usually through a monetary investment. I've trained plenty of people in the past for free, for absolutely free. A couple of them have done really, really well. Most of them just do all right. Versus people who I've trained who I charge a very, very little amount. And I, and I literally say to them, it's like, Hey, you know, and and this was, you know, building business strategy and getting clients and testing stuff and you know, all all that kind of those things where it's like, Hey, I'm just going to charge you this much because I just, I just need you to have like some amount of investment and it might be like 20 bucks or 50 bucks or something very small for the, for the amount that they're getting. And, you know, they're cool with it, obviously, and they do significantly better than the people who are just for free. And I think it's just because, I mean, skin in the game. There's no reason, like the training program is the same. I gave them the same stuff. I gave these, you know, treated them the same, gave them all the same resources, information and access and all that stuff. But when you have skin in the game, when you've invested in something and and this goes up, the amount, the, the, for the amount of investment that, for the the significance of the investment, losing my words, for the significance of investment, if you paid a thousand dollars for something, you're going to probably work harder at that thing than if you paid 10 bucks for it because it's like well i paid a thousand bucks for this i better i better use it and put it to work so think about that when considering investing in your fitness and your health there's two ways to think about this one okay this this pro this program or whatever is going to cost me let's just use a simple number because it doesn't matter it's going to cost me a hundred bucks well it's going to cost me a hundred dollars well what's it going to cost me to not do this you could figure it out on your own. Fitness is it's not rocket science. There's plenty of free information out there for you to be able to figure it out on your own. So yes, you you, you easily could, but you haven't to, to, to date. And that's why you're looking for this you know $100 program, whatever it is. So it'll cost you a hundred bucks to get in the program, get the coaching, get the whatever. And obviously coaching is more than a hundred bucks, but it costs you a hundred bucks to get in the thing. What does it cost you to not do it? How many more months, how many more days, weeks are you going to think about, oh, I should really be doing better. I should be, what exercise should I be doing? How should I be eating? How should I be doing this, that, and the other thing? How many more YouTube videos I got to watch? Like, Or you just pay the money and someone teaches it to you. So not doing something also has a cost and, and, just, and just keep that in mind. But having skin in the game, you know, downloading another free ebook, downloading someone else's e- email list giveaway, downloading another or watching another YouTube series or another podcast, like... Those are great. They're time investments. And when you pay for something, you're going to actually do the thing. So don't be afraid. And obviously, you know, everyone's financial situation is different, my own included. Don't be afraid to invest in, in, in things because it's going to help you do the thing more or better. A couple more things here. Works better than it should. Only pull-ups help pull-ups. I don't know how many times I've seen this. Uh, basically everyone who I've ever trained. <laughs> so a lot. Um, the only way that you get better at doing pull-ups is by practicing actual pull-ups. And there are ways to break this down. You know, did a great episode, the super detail about this with Angela Gargano. This is a bunch of, I don't remember the number now, but scroll back and you'll find it. Super good episode on pull-ups. Um, lat pull-downs and various other back exercises and grip exercises and biceps and these things. It helps, but I've never seen someone 
not do any pull-ups, just do a bunch of lat pull-downs and a bunch of bicep curls and a bunch of whatever, and then get on the pull-up bar and just be able to do pull-ups. I've never seen it ever. The other side of this is that even if you are strong, and I see this with myself often, not that often, but often enough, where it's like, say I'm doing pull-ups for, you know, in a certain phase of programming, let's say it's for like three phases over three months, then then I, for whatever reason, like I, I stop doing pull-ups. My, when I come back to it, even though I may have gotten stronger and still continue training in other ways and doing different exercises and whatever, my ability to do pull-ups is less than it was before. It doesn't mean that I got weaker. It just means that I got worse at doing pull-ups. And I don't know why that is. I, 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 I can't figure it out. It just seems to be true. It seems to be true with me and it seems to be true with a lot of people that I train. So only pull-ups help pull-ups. Um, so, you know, if you want to get better at pull-ups, do pull-ups. And stats profits is the only way to get better at stats is doing stats. He's right. And the only way to get better at pull-ups is doing pull-ups and you can scale those back in, in, in many different ways, but only pull-ups help pull-ups. On the flip side of this, hip thrusts don't help anything except for hip thrusts. And the reason that I say that in like a negative flip, because you could say, because pull-ups will translate backwards. If you get stronger at pull-ups, you get stronger at other back movements. If you get stronger at hip thrust, you get a little stronger in general, but you don't like, I've never seen someone's hip thrust skyrocket and then their deadlift also skyrocket or their squat. It just gets you better at doing hip thrust. And that's fine if that's your only goal, but it's probably, probably not. It just seems to not be like a very translatable exercise. Um, so this is one that works worse than it should on paper to, <laughs> to be the contrary, but People like doing hip thrusts for whatever reason, and it feels good, and you can move a lot of weight, and so that makes you, you know, strokes your ego, and, and for whatever that's worth, so it's not bad, but it just doesn't translate over that much. Um, along with routine is training at the same time of day, every day in your week, so like if you know that you do your leg day in the morning, do your leg day in the morning all the time as best you can if you do your you know on wednesday's workout you do your wednesday at the afternoon stick to that time it's just again this whole concept of getting your body like in the mood getting the body in the zone feeling like it's supposed to be feeling and you know kind of expecting what's coming and these are all like very esoteric terms that don't really mean a lot but if you get into that that routine it it definitely it definitely helps now this was one thought so like, see, this is the problem with not like scripting this at all is sometimes I write things that don't make sense. And that's why I was kind of like stumbling on my words. Um, th- this is something that I want to end on here. And this is not like, yeah, you know, I guess this kind of follows the same line of like <laughs> things that work better than they should. If you don't care about being particularly strong or particularly lean you just want to be healthy and and feel good and you know look like you work out and look reasonably fit and, and and feel good a lot of the details about nutrition and training specifically and all these things just doesn't really matter and that that pains me to say, because I, I love details. I love the minutia. I love trying to optimize training and nutrition. And it's obviously, this is, this is my job. So I try and think, well, well, how how can we do this better? And not at the sacrifice of things, but how can we do this better given, given the tools and the time and the resources that we have? So, you know, admitting that sometimes a lot of stuff doesn't matter. It it hurts. It hurts. And, And I say that it doesn't matter because well, well, because it's true. You look around at some people and it's like, there's some people that they don't know what they're doing. They go in the gym, they train kind of hard. They eat kind of good. They follow a diet that kind of seems silly because they saw such and such influencer do it. But like, for whatever reason, they buy into it. They buy into the hype and and it happens to suit their lifestyle and they actually like doing it. It doesn't cause them any harm. And they go into the gym and they follow some, you know, on paper, kind of a stupid workout program. But, you know, whatever, it's a workout program. They're not trying to get be, you know, Mr. Olympia or Mrs. Olympia, get in a bikini show, look super jacked, 9% body fat. They're just trying to look healthy, feel good. So they follow a bad workout program. They follow a silly kind of diet, but they follow it and they do it with a reasonable amount of intensity and they follow it for 
two, three, five, eight, ten years. And they look good. They feel good. They feel happy. And that's the proof. And we all know people like this. You see them at the gym. And you're like, oh, I wonder what wonder what that person does. If you ask them, they'll tell you, but it literally doesn't make any sense. It's not the right, it's certainly not the most efficient way to go about it. And and they would never and they and these people also like they stop improving pretty quickly. But they get to a point where it's like, Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with where I'm at, so I just keep doing this thing to keep doing this thing. But it's not like they're not gaining muscle, they're not getting stronger, they're not, you know, whatever, but they don't want to. And so that's fine. Because you're allowed to do whatever you want, thankfully. But the, the, the take home message here is that consistency beats everything. Everything. If you just keep going, if you just do it, if you just find that plan that like sounds good to me, if you believe it, it's good, find that thing and then just do that. Now, if you want to start optimizing, say, I want to get a little bigger. I want to start to like really look good and really look strong and move a lot of weight and really get dialed in lean. Yeah. Then, then stuff is going to stop working. But if you just want to look like, yeah, I just want to feel good and kind of look like I work out. Literally just do anything. Stop thinking about it. Find whoever you think sounds the smartest to you, looks the best, their message resonates with you the most. Just do that. And you can hear like the hesitation in my voice because I don't like saying that. I don't like admitting this. But it's true. It's true. Consistency wins every time. I do like saying that. But, you know, I wish that sometimes it was a little bit more complicated So that like the smart people can kind of rise to the top. But the reason that a lot of these loud influencer types can get away with like doing stuff that's like, eh, it's really easy to pick apart for someone who's like a bit of a, you know, fitness science nerd. The reason it works is because the bar is very low. People are completely untrained, eat complete shit, don't do anything. And it's like, well, you just follow such and such person's nutrition guide. It's like, well, their nutrition guide doesn't include eating McDonald's every day and, and eating chocolate chip cookies every single night and not working out. So they have some type of workout in there. They have some type of nutrition structure in there. Yeah. If you just do that, it'll be good. And so like it works. So the take home message with the back half of this, the whole episode is, is two things. One consistency wins every time. And two, if you believe it and it doesn't harm you or harm anyone else, then it works and do that. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks for listening. DanielYoris.com slash coaching. If you're looking for online coaching, especially if you're getting married in the next year, I really want to work with you. I really want to help you look the best in your day, you and your partner. Um, and let's get that going because that's going to be that's going to be something really special and a really interesting project um, for, for, for me to take on both from like a demographic perspective and from like a from a motivation of the people who are in that demographic as well. And, and just to kind of, you know, can see to see what we can do and to 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 set the stage for the rest of your life. And yes, that's about your marriage, but also like to set the stage for the rest of your fitness life, um, which is the rest of your life. So danielyorst.com slash coaching links in the show notes, share this episode with your friends. Um, thank you very much for, for being with me. I I know I say this a lot of times, but but like, you know, episode 133, I, I, it's super cool that the podcast is like, that even one person listens to it. it, it, it's, uh, it's, It's pretty awesome. It's growing slowly, steadily, and surely. Um, We'll get there. If you have any questions about anything, never hesitate to reach out. If you have tips, advice, suggestions to, you know, make this show better and all this stuff, I'm always open to anything, constructive criticism, positive, negative, whatever. Let me know so I can help, so you can help me help you. And that's that. Follow me everywhere, all that stuff. Um, Appreciate you. Go outside. Be a good person. See you soon.